Thank you very much for being here this evening. I'd especially like to thank Jessica, my new co-president, who's been absolutely phenomenal. We even may have a working website soon. We just come off a 75th anniversary year, which was tremendous. We had one of the largest audiences for a debate, which happened to be between Sean Bielet and Joseph Kennedy um, at Wellesley College. It was phenomenal, over 1,100 people present and we teamed up with other area leagues for this. And the whole year was a terrific year of celebration. Now we're turning to the agricultural study at, uh, that the National League is conducting. And we are so fortunate because for personal reasons, Norman Turrell, who is, has been sitting on the national board for um, three terms, and uh, one term I had the privilege of sitting on the national board with Norman, He's um, currently chairing the Technology Committee, but more to the point, he's chairing the Agricultural Committee. And um, this is an update, as he will tell you, on a study that the League did many years ago, but uh, broadening, uh, going into new territory that uh, focuses on food safety and other issues. Um, Norman himself, personally, has been a leader in Common Cause and in other organizations. He's been the head, the president, of um, various um, state leagues, is that right? Yes, various common cause leagues. And now um, he's been a leader um, with the League of Women Voters and we are just so thrilled to have him come today to talk a bit about the study and about what he has learned thus far. So thank you, please um, welcome, a warm Wellesley welcome to Norman Terrell. Thank you, Marlena, for that kind introduction. Um, I feel like I'm a little scattered here with all of you all over the room here, but uh, feel free to ask questions wherever you feel like it's necessary. I, I respond probably better to questions than I do in a formal situation. What I'd like to do is first uh, talk a little bit about why the League does studies uh, for the benefit of people that aren't League members here and the TV audience that uh, might also not know about the League much. And then I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the national study and uh, then I want to uh, give some, maybe some uh, personal opinions on some of the topics in the study. Uh, I want to first maybe put out a disclaimer that uh, my presence here today is uh, not representing anybody but myself. I'm not representing the National League and, and I'm not certainly not representing the uh, study committee. So uh, what you'll hear is some opinions of my own on uh, important topics, but uh, uh, you can take them for what they're worth, sometimes nothing. Um, so. Why does the League do studies? Uh, well, the first thing is that we advocate on uh, particular issues in either the local community, the state legislature, or, or Congress. And in order to uh, do that advocacy, we have to have what we call a position. And we get a position by having our members agree on what we believe about that particular topic for the position. And in order for our members to agree, we go through a process which we call consensus. And before we can do consensus, we have to actually study the, the issue, which is rather unique among organizations. I, I'm not really aware of any other organization that actually studies issues before deciding what it believes about it. And even before that, we have to go through a process where our uh, conventions uh, either at the local, state, or national level have to decide on what we're going to study. So that's how this agriculture update study began. We, in our national convention last year in Washington, D.C., some 800 people came together as delegates and they decided that they wanted to do a update of the agriculture position that we already have. And that uh, position is maybe uh, 30 years old, or 25 anyway, and has to be updated for modern considerations in agriculture and food. And so after the uh, convention passed that motion, the uh, National Board decided in its wisdom that I should uh, lead this study, and we got together a committee, uh, which is about eight people, 
to research the different topics that are in the study, and that's where we currently are. We're still uh, preparing materials for our league members who will then read the, the materials, meet together in people's living rooms, uh, come to consensus on what it is that they believe, and they will report to the National League uh, as to what their league believes about the subject or the subjects, and then we will somehow roll this up into one position, uh, which we can then finally advocate on at the national level or the any level of the league. So the league is structured in national, state, and local leagues, and each one is uh, more or less independent of the others, and, and we uh, somehow make it all work. Um, the uh, study itself um, is really boiling down to three topics. Uh, one is uh, a description on, of functions of all the different agencies of the federal government that get into uh, regulating food and agriculture. Uh, certainly the uh, Department of Agriculture, the USDA, uh, the EPA, the FDA, the CDC, the uh, Patent and Trademark Office, which is the USPTO, and then the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, all are involved in some aspect of uh, regulating this thing we call food and agriculture. And so we'll talk a little bit and describe about those and all the interactions of those uh, different agencies, alphabet soup of agencies, and then uh, come to some uh, agreement about what we believe those agencies really should be regulating instead of uh, what they are maybe now regulating. Um, the second part of the um, update is about biotechnology or, or agriculture technology. There's a, a several topics in this, the plant breeding and biodiversity, genetic engineering, pesticide management, soil management, water management, animal management, and maybe some other topics in there too about technology. And then the third part is about um, the business of agriculture, crop insurance, uh, crop subsidies, and, and so on. Um, so those are the three broad areas of the um, things that we're going to get into. I want to focus in on some particularly uh, hot topics in this. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, genetic engineering and uh, GE foods or crops or GMOs, which all mean the same thing more or less. Uh, and then we can talk about maybe some GMO labeling as well. These are uh, very deep topics and we could probably spend the whole evening talking about each of these, but I'll just give you uh, some of my own opinions about this. First, I want to make sure you all understand that uh, genetic engineering and uh, GMOs have never harmed anybody uh, that we know of. The uh, foods that uh, you are now eating, most of them uh, come from genetically engineered crops. Something like 80 or 90 percent of the crops that are now on the market in your stores are in some ways uh, produced from genetic engineering uh, crops. Uh, but there is maybe some harm that is done to the environment from these crops. So for example, one type of genetically engineered crop is a uh, type of corn that uh, has built into its uh, genome a, a pesticide, or herbicide really, uh, which is uh, called BT, short for Bacillus thuringiensis. if I pronounce that right. In any case, um, this is a, um, a toxin to plants that uh, is actually naturally occurring and it comes from a uh, bacterium in the soil. And organic farmers actually use this uh, microbe in controlling the weeds in their uh, organic gardens. And the scientists have just taken this uh, one gene out of this bacteria and planted it into the middle of a corn crop, a corn uh, genome. Um, in any case, it helps control the uh, uh, insects that are in the field that would otherwise uh, eat the corn particularly the corn borer, and that way they save a lot of money on the crop itself that isn't eaten by insects and also on the uh, pesticides that they would otherwise apply to the uh, corn, the field of the corn. In any case, um, that's just one example uh, of this, but uh, 
it's, it's not something that maybe, it, it doesn't harm humans, but it does harm the, uh, the weeds that are in the field. And after a while of using this uh, BT corn for uh, repeated crops in the same field, often the weeds start to evolve faster than the corn. And so they have to start applying more pesticide again. And that in turn uh, alters the local ecology of the, of the farm. So there might maybe some harm done in uh, these crops after all. Um, it's, it's a trade-off. You have to understand that there's uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of uh, genetically engineered uh, organisms. Each one has a, a discrete change in its uh, genome that uh, is for a particular purpose. And the purpose might be pesticides, or it might be tolerance to drought, or it might be tolerance to being submerged in water, or it might be uh, altering the nutrition. For example, there's a, a rice crop they call the golden rice that has uh, vitamin A built into it. And it doesn't make much difference to us in the United States, but in uh, other parts of the world where they subsist on the rice crop, they don't get any vitamin A otherwise, and so it's really important for them to get some vitamin A. And so if that's built into the rice, so that's uh, causing uh, a lot of people not to get blind. Anyway, there's lots of different kinds of GMOs. Uh, I'd like to make a distinction between genetic engineering, which is actually a, a whole set of techniques. Uh, there's maybe hundreds of these little techniques that are used for altering the uh, genetics of, of these organisms. Uh, and the product of that genetic engineering, which is the crop or the food that uh, is then used. The engineering itself is just a, a, a technique, and, uh, but the product itself is what actually does the business. Uh, so there's such a great variety about these things, though, is you can't really generalize about any of them. What is true for one type of genetically engineered crop isn't true at all for another type. And as I said, there's hundreds or thousands of these uh, different plants and animals that uh, you have to really consider each one in its own merits, pros and cons, and then decide if, if that's beneficial in the context that you want it to be used. Uh, you'll hear a great number of generalizations about genetic engineering. And if anybody generalizes to, to you like that, you can just tell them that they don't know what you're talking about because it, you can't really generalize because there's such a vast, vast variety of these different uh, plants and animals. I um, also want to make a distinction between the uh, genetically engineered crop and the uh, product that might actually be made from that crop, uh, which may or may not have some genetically engineered component. So for example, there's a, a type of uh, sugar beet that is resistant to a Roundup and they use this to control the, the weeds around the beets. But uh, the sugar beets are then used for making sugar. The sugar itself has nothing to do with the genetic engineering, and it's in fact a 99.99% pure product because it's recrystallized in the process of making the sugar. And there's, there's nothing about it that's gen genetically engineered. So you have to make a distinction between the plant and the products that come from the plant. Um, so I think that's about what I wanted to say about that. Oh, uh, you'll hear that uh, sometimes genes have been taken from other types of uh, animal or plant. For example, there's a, a genetically engineered uh, plant that is resistant to um, frost. That, and the gene that helps with that is taken, as I recall, from shrimp. Well, it, the fact that the gene comes from shrimp really has no consequence at all. It's just from shrimp. But the gene itself has a particular uh, trait that it adds to the plant. And uh, whether or not that's a good or bad thing has to be judged on the circumstances that you're going to be using that particular plant in, not because it has to do with shrimp. Um, and you'll hear things about frankenfoods. Well, that's a bunch of uh, 
uh, hype, really, that is uh, trying to scare people about these kinds of foods. Again, you need to consider the vast variety of uh, different traits that can be transferred between different uh, plants and animals and consider the, in the context that they're being used. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about GMO labeling. Now that you know something about genetically engineered and genetic uh, GMOs, um, there's a lot of people that are trying to get foods to be labeled with uh, the, the label that they are GMOs. Well, from what I just said, you'll understand that there may or may not be something that's been genetically engineered in the product that is there. But the fact that it's G a GMO really tells you almost nothing about the traits that have been put into that particular food or product. Um, because there's hundreds or thousands of traits that might be uh, moved around and, and altered. Uh, just labeling it as GMO doesn't tell you anything about the actual gene or its effects on you or anybody else. So what is actually useful to be on uh, food labels is something that we hopefully will come to consensus with in the uh, study. but. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how that comes out if we get any consensus at all. So I want to stop here uh, and see, do we want to take questions now or later? Later. Okay, so uh, thank you for your attention. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Seneff. Uh, Dr. Seneff is a senior research scientist at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. She has a BA from MIT in biology, maybe that's a BS, BS, with a minor in food and nutrition, and her PhD from MIT is in computer science. Dr. Seneff is the first author of several recently published papers and was cited in Prevention Magazine's April article called MIT Paper Links Chemicals Used on Genetically Modified Foods to Infertility and Cancer. On a personal note, I would like to thank Dr. Seneff for her courage in speaking out publicly against glyphosate. She is now under attack professionally by the corporation that manufactures glyphosate. And uh, I think she should be commended for her moral courage. And we're very grateful to have her here tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I know there's a baseball game about to happen, so I'm sure people are eager to get this done quickly. Um, I'm Stephanie Seneff, and I've got my clicker here. That's my title, and I have a picture to show. <laughs> all right, so here's the outline. I'm going to go quickly through a lot of slides. I have a lot of information to give you, but hopefully you'll be able to absorb most of it. Um, I'm going to start by mentioning the autism epidemic, which I'm very worried about. I'm going to talk about gut microbes and digestive disorders. I'm going to present some statistics that will be quite interesting to see. I'm going to talk about some things, uh, some effects of glyphosate uh, involving endocrine disruption, cancer, and kidney failure. And then I'm going to talk about some new GMO research and finally a summary. So that's where we're going. Starting out with this, the autism epidemic. Back in 2007, I got really worried. I've been watching the autism rates steadily climb over the last 20, 30 years. 2007, I said to myself that I need to take a look at this. Somebody needs to figure out what's happening here. There's clearly something in the environment, probably multiple things in the environment that are causing this. And uh, uh, as a biologist, I maybe could try to figure that out. And I, so I studied it. Uh, I watched the rate go down, go up and up. Now, 2009, one in 100. And the most recent number, March 2013, one in 50. This is getting to be a very, very worrisome number. And autism is not a trivial thing to have. For those of you who know people who have children with autism, it can be a very severe dis disability. Um, so I project at this rate, one in two by the quarter century mark. So half the kids born will be on the autism spectrum if we stay the course. So we need to figure out what it is in the environment that's causing this, and we need to fix it. Very clear to me. So in 1970, the rate was one in 10,000, which is a sobering thought. 
So I started looking into it. I did a lot of research. I actually wrote several papers. I have co collaborators of maybe six or seven papers on autism before I had looked into glyphosate. Because, um, so I identified a lot of things. Other people have identified these things as well. Autism is very complex. And one thing for sure is that it's associated with disruptive gut bacteria. They have a lot of problems with their digestive system, inflamed gut, leaky gut. And this is connected to the gut brain through the great gut brain access to the brain. So I told the story, I wrote a paper with collaborators, told the story of how once there's a problem with the gut, how it can then cause effects on the brain that can explain autism. I was frustrated when I wrote that paper because I said I don't know to myself. I don't know what's causing this gut problem. Other things, de depletion in serotonin supply, this is also associated with a lot of other conditions that we're facing today, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And then deficiency in sulfur metabolites and a major uh, disturbance of the whole sulfur system in the body, which is a very serious problem that I think is the most important contributor to the brain dysfunction in autism. So the question, is there a toxic substance that's in, currently in our environment on the rise in step with the increasing rates of autism that could explain this, these comorbidities. And so the answer is yes, I'm quite sure that I'm right, and the answer is glyphosate. And this is the paper that I wrote with Anthony Samso. I was very fortunate to be able to hook up with him. He's a brilliant man. He's been studying glyphosate for many years, and he just started pouring papers at me, and I would get up in the morning and read glyphosate papers all day long and then drop into bed exhausted at night to, to, get, to figure this out. And it was astonishing what we found. So uh, you can read this paper. It, you don't have to, it's not a pay-per-view, it's open access, so you can go find it on the web and read it for yourself. And there's also things written about it that might help you to understand it. Um, glyphosate suppression of cytochrome P450 enzymes and amino acid biosynthesis by the gut microbe pathways to modern diseases. So glyphosate. Roundup, you all know about Roundup. Probably you don't, many of you know the word glyphosate, but that's the active ingredient in Roundup. And it looks like that, a very simple molecule, oops, I did that wrong. Yeah, a very simple molecule actually, very deceptively simple. Um, it's now the number one herbicide used in the US and increasingly around the world. Um, it was developed by Monsanto in 1970 and it was introduced in, to the US market first in 1974. It came out under patent in 2000, and after that it became much more available worldwide because the price dropped. So now China is using a great deal of it as well. It's going around the world, increasing everywhere. Um, and it's become the number one herbicide uh, in use because of its uh, cheap price now and also because of its quote-unquote non-toxicity. So um, what it does is it inhibits this shikimate pathway and this is a pathway that's involved in the synthesis of these three aromatic amino acids. This pathway exists in plants, and it doesn't exist in humans, human cells. So Monsanto argues that it's safe because of that. Now, the interesting thing is that the huge expansion of GMO corn, soy, cotton, sugar beet, and canola crops has led to the sharp increases in glyphosate that we've seen because 90% of the GMOs, there's many, many GMOs, as he said, but 90% of them involve resistance to Roundup. The GMO makes the plant resistant so you can spray Roundup on it and it won't die. And what that means is that you do spray Roundup on it and it soaks up the Roundup and it gets into the food system. And that is a very, very serious problem. It also affects the plant and, and, and decreases its nutritional value. So um, is it non-toxic? And as I said, Monsanto has said it is because we don't have that pathway. And the important thing is that our gut bacteria, all of them have this pathway. And we depend upon them to supply us with the amino acids that are produced by them in this pathway. Because we can't make those amino acids. We can't make them because we don't have that pathway. And those amino acids are extremely important to our health. And then there's other ingredients in Roundup that greatly increase the toxic effects of glyphosate. A lot of the studies are done just on glyphosate, and it can't get into the cell. But if you add the surfactants that are in Roundup, then all of a sudden the glyphosate becomes much more toxic. And then the insidious effects accumulate over time. So one of the things is that the studies that Monsanto has done last typically for three months. After three months, you don't see any problem. Problems start to appear at four months. And a study was done over the entire lifetime of rats 
and it found a huge number of problems with cancer in a shorter lifespan and generally um, lots of difficulties with these rats that were exposed to glyphosate throughout their lifespan. Um, so here's some biological effects I mentioned already, aromatic amino acids, also methionine, that's the um, core sulfur containing amino acid that supplies sulfur to your body. Um, it does disrupt gut bacteria and that's been shown in chickens, cows and pigs. Uh, with this overgrown uh, growth of pathogenic bacteria in the gut, which is the same thing you see in autism. It disrupts these CYP enzymes, and these enzymes are really important for many biological functions. It depletes several important minerals, and especially these rare manganese, zinc, cobalt, iron, uh, molybdenum. These are really, really important uh, minerals to make, keep your enzymes working properly. And then it impairs sulfate synthesis and sulfate transport. And one of the major things with autism is, is a severe deficiency in sulfate in the brain. So I'm going to go into a little more detail about these two here on the next page. This one is these aromatic amino acids. Tryptophan is one of them. It's a precursor to serotonin, which is a precursor to melatonin. And these are really important neurotransmitters in the brain. They involve um, deficiencies are associated with obesity, autism, Alzheimer's, depression, and violent behavior. Uh, melatonin controls the sleep-wake cycle. Tyrosine is another one of these amino acids, precursor to dopamine, adrenaline, melanin. You've heard of these words. These are really important biological molecules. Dopamine is going to go to Parkinson's disease if you're deficient. Melanin protects you from UV, so you're going to get skin cancer. Mel methionine is, is the essential sulfur-containing amino acid that supplies sulfur to your body. It disrupts these enzymes, which are involved in a huge number of things. Here's some things that I would mention. Vitamin D regulation, vitamin D activation, cholesterol metabolism, that's why people have high cholesterol. Sex hormones, that's how you can get into things like infertility. Bile acid production to digest the fats. Detoxifying other environmental toxins is a really important one. You disrupt the enzymes that detoxify the toxins, the other toxins become much more dangerous to you. And then stabilizing the blood. You have a lot of problems with elderly today fighting a, a, a tight wire between hemorrhaging and blood clots. And they're all on Coumadin because their blood is, una is not functioning properly. That's cytochrome P450 enzymes. So here's some biomarkers for, for autism. I mentioned the gut bacteria, inflammatory bowel, low sulfate, methionine, that's the sulfur uh, amino acid, serotonin, melatonin, aromatase is the cyp enzyme. These are um, and minerals, and then these other things I've talked about in the paper, they're a little bit harder to explain. All these things can be explained by glyphosate. So, to summarize, autism rates have been increasing at an alarming rate in step with the increases in glyphosate application to the GMO products, foods. Autism is associated with disrupted gut bacteria, serotonin deficiency, impaired immune function, sulfate deficiency, etc., all of which can be explained by glyphosate. And then they can also explain many other modern diseases and conditions. So second topic, gut microbes and digestive disorders. Our microbes, people are realizing more and more today how important these microbes are to our health. They outnumber our, our own cells 10 to 1. For every cell, human cell, there's 10 microbes in your body. You're actually a home for the body. You can think of yourself as a home for the bacteria. And they have um, a lot more genes than we do. 200, 300 different species in a typical person. And what happens with glyphosate is that it causes these pathogens to overgrow and they produce toxins like toxic phenols, which can then lead to inflammatory bowel disease. This can go to obesity and it can also go to problems in the brain because these things can travel to the brain and disrupt its function. Um, and there's, for example, this study talks about gut microbes taken from an obese person induced obesity in mice. So the microbes themselves are actually causing you to be obese in response to the glyphosate. Here's an uh, article that came out actually after our article, so we didn't talk about it in our paper. Um, very interesting, a study on pigs. Their digestive system is very similar to ours. And these, anecdotally, they were observing inflammation in the stomach and various problems with the intestines and hemorrhagic bowel disease in these pigs that were being fed GMO food that had been sprayed with glyphosate. So they did a, a formal experiment with 168 pigs that were just weaned, and they had two groups, one GMO and one organic, to, and compared those two groups of pigs. And here's what they found. The GMO feed healthy gut, and the, I mean the uh, non-GMO feed healthy gut, and the GMO feed 
extremely inflamed gut. Um, the female pigs had a 25% uh, larger um, uterus, so a, sw a swollen uterus. And they were 2.2 times as likely to get severe stomach inflammation on the GMO diet. And the males were four times as likely to get this problem on the GMO diet. Um, human digestive system problems. So today we're seeing an alarming increase in a number of diseases, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, acid reflux, gluten and casein intolerance, celiac disease, leaky gut, all these things are showing up more and more in people today. Um, and as I said, the gut-brain axis can then cause neurological problems in response to the gut problems. And I believe that glyphosate is a major cause of, what's the, of all of this. So you, now you see your new gluten-free section of your grocery store everywhere. It's just all of a sudden, all of them have these gluten-free sections. It's really come up overnight, this problem. Um, books have been written about the uh, hidden epidemic of celiac disease. Uh, it's quadrupled. The rate is quadrupled in the last 50 years. So we looked at celiac disease, and we now have a new paper under review. So hopefully, we'll see if it can get through the review process. It was amazing. This is the second, second paper following our first one. And we found a huge number of, of explanations for all these complex things that are associated with celiac disease that can be explained by glyphosate, the same story as we saw with autism. Here's some examples. Bifidobacteria are depleted in celiac disease. They can convert gluten to a less toxic form. So if you don't have them, you're going to have a toxic form. Glyphosate actually kills those bacteria. Celiac disease is also associated with an increased risk to this particular cancer, and glyphosate itself is also linked directly to that same cancer. So I think, uh, I mean, we found a, no a huge number of other things, but I don't have time to talk about them now. Um, so this is interesting, and this is not something I found on the web, describing problems that they're seeing with uh, weeds, that they've figured out a way to fix these problems, which I find to be absolutely shocking. And the way they fix the problems, so here's extra, is ryegrass, which you don't want growing in your wheat. So what you can do is you can spray glyphosate on the wheat crop right before the harvest. And that will kill the wheat, because the wheat is not glyphosate resistant. But you will grab the wheat, it will actually cause the wheat to go to seed and you'll get a more synchronous har harvest, and you'll get a larger yield. The plant will then immediately die from the glyphosate, and the glyphosate will go into the seed that you feed, put into your breakfast cereal. And so it's killing the ryegrass. So here they're saying we may be able to knock out 80% to 90% of the resistant ryegrass with glyphosate right before the harvest. This is being done to wheat, to barley, to sugarcane, and it's a relatively new thing that's been happening over the last 10 years. On top of the GMO problem, this is not a GMO issue. So here's a, a, an interesting bacterium, Pseudomonas. It's becoming a pest, Pseudomonas arug aruginosa. That's a gram-negative bacterium. It's a major problem in the hospitals today. You throw the kitchen sink at it, and it won't die. It's like resistant to all the different antibiotics. It turns out it has a skill, a unique skill, which is that it can break down glyphosate. So in a sense, if you've got an infection of that, it's doing you a favor because it's getting rid of the glyphosate. But it's replacing it with formaldehyde, which is also a neurotoxin. So, you know, take your pick. But it's probably encouraging, it's growing because it's being supplied with the glyphosate that's killing off all the other bacteria. It can thrive on glyphosate. Um, so here's uh, some statistics. A hospitalization of children with inflammatory bowel disease a study that was done on, on a huge number, 11 million hospitalization records, of children under 20 years old. And they showed a 49% increase over this period of time in Crohn's and a 71% increase in ulcerative, ulcerative colitis uh, upon exit. So these are evidence that children are getting a lot more problems with their guts. So to summarize, we depend on our gut bacteria in many ways. Obese person's bacteria can induce obesity in mice. Glyphosate is an antibiotic preferentially kills the good bacteria, leaving behind the pathogens, which can cause all kinds of problems. This is illustrated in pigs. They develop inflammatory gut. Humans are experiencing all these gut disorders, and this business with the ryegrass is causing them to spray glyphosate on the wheat crop right before the harvest, which I think has a direct consequence of celiac disease and gluten intolerance. And then this particular bacterium, which is a growing problem, has a unique skill that it can break down glyphosate, so it's not toxic to it. Okay, some statistics. Here's an interesting look at the GE corn and soy. 
These are all GE crops engineered to be resistant to Roundup. Started in 1996, very few. 2012, everybody's up at 90%. So we've basically gone from zero to 90 in about 15 years. 90% of the crop is Roundup ready, which means you spray, they, they routinely spray the glyphosate on the crop, it soaks it up, it gets into your food. Um, here's an interesting plot of the use of herbicides over time, again, 1990 to 2009, and this is all uh, herbicides, this is all uh, insecticides, and then this is the one herbicide whose usage is going way up, which is glyphosate. It's the only one. So none of the other ones can be explained in the autism epidemic because they're not going up. This is the only one. Now this, I think, is the most remarkable plot in my entire uh, set of slides. And I should mention this woman, Nancy Swanson. She's really neat. She's a physicist, and she has published some amazing plots. There's a lot more that you can find on the web of correlations with all kinds of diseases. And I'll have a little bit more of them here, but you can even find a, a much larger number of plots, all of them showing strong correlations between disease and Roundup. This one is autism, so the number of with autism in the, enrolled in the school system, the yellow squares, and the red plot is the glyphosate applied to corn and soy. So just looking at the corn and soy, which goes into all the processed foods, crops, almost a perfect match between the growth of the Roundup applied for corn and soy and the growth in the incidence of autism in the school system. This is a 0.99 Pearson correlation coefficient. I never see, you never see numbers like that in correlations. They always say correlation does not necessarily mean causation. In this case, I think it does. So we consume 25% of the world market of glyphosate. We do not have 25% of the world population. So we are privileged in the US to get a lot more exposure to glyphosate than other countries in the world. So here's another, some more plots from Nancy. Um, this is a, a diabetes plot, and this is what diabetes looks like. You can see there's kind of a slow rise going with this green line, and then it starts to shift to a much higher rise in diabetes right around the time that glyphosate gets introduced. So if you take out the green line, you get this plot over here, which shows these two lines involve the percentage of GE corn and soy is the red, and the blue is the amount of glyphosate being used on them. You can see they pretty much wrap around the plot of the, of the diabetes increase. Very good correlation there as well. So um, that's just removing the trend. So she has a whole bunch of plots, and then she can compute Pearson correlation coefficients on all of them. This is only some of them, but I will say that all of these diseases are things we talked about in our paper, because we could see how they would connect up with glyphosate from the way glyphosate works in physiology. We had not seen these plots until after we wrote the paper. So I was really gratified to see that what she's seeing in the statistics correlates with what we're seeing from the biology. There's a perfect fit. And so here are some of the things. Obesity, now these numbers, this is the p-value, the likelihood that this thing could have occurred by chance is extremely small. E minus 007 means a number like that. 0 .005, 0 0.05 is considered significant. So this is extremely significant. And all of these have these really high decimal points, several zeros, very, very significant correlations between obesity and glyphosate. This is glyphosate usage on corn and soy. Obesity, diabetes, two forms of diabetes, end-stage kidney disease, uh, incidence and prevalence, autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia. All of these are very strongly correlated with glyphosate usage on corn and soy. Um, so this is a plot that was taken from a paper that was arguing that sugar was causing obesity. The paper goes back to 1700, a long time ago, showing that we sort of grew slowly. You know, we got, uh, this is the sugar usage, and the obesity only shows up here, starting in 1900, and there's an increase in obesity from 1900 to 1975. But when glyphosate was introduced in 1975, and you can see that there's a corner, all of a sudden the obesity epidemic is getting much worse with the introduction of glyphosate. So I think glyphosate is the main cause. Something else was going on here, but I don't know what it was. Infant mortality. Our rate is over 2.5 times the rate in Japan and Sweden. And the diver divergence began in 1975, right when we introduced um, glyphosate. This is the US, and this is the other developed nations, and there's a, a gradual a growing increase in the gap. So our infants are not doing nearly as well as other people's infants are doing. And we're now number 46 on infant mortality behind Cuba and Guam. 
And we're also number one on infant mortality on the first day after birth, number one. No, I mean, the worst, the bottom of the pile on infant mortality on the first day. So we've seen a tremendous growth in GMO crops, along with a tremendous increase in glyphosate. Use of Roundup on corn and soy correlates very strongly with the observed increase, uh, increases in all of these nasty diseases. Uh, the obesity epidemic began in 1975, and our decline in the infant mortality also began in 1975, when glyphosate was introduced into the market. So now endocrine disruption, cancer, and kidney failure. This is Nancy Swanson, a quote, more and more studies have revealed carcinogenic and endocrine disrupting effects of Roundup at lower doses than those authorized for residues found in genetically modified organisms. So that means we're, we are vulnerable to these problems even at the levels that are allowed by the government. Um, so here's a, uh, some studies. Low and environmentally relevant concentrations of glyphosate possess estrogenic activity. Another paper that came out after we published our paper, 2013, very new paper, found that glyphosate could cause human hormone-dependent breast cancer cells to proliferate at concentrations of parts per trillion. That is extremely small concentrations. And then if, you are, if it's in soy, you've got the additional effect of genistein to make the situation worse. Certainly, we have a problem with breast cancer in this country as well. Um, anencephaly is a, a rare, very rare uh, deformity in the child that basically says no brain. It means that the child is born without a brain. Uh, in Yakima, Benton, and Franklin counties in Washington state, there's been an unusually high number of pregnancies that have this very, very rare disorder. So they started trying to figure out what might be causing it, and they found indeed that they were using a lot of different pesticides. 75 different pesticides were analyzed to try to figure out what might be causing this. And they did find a significant, 63% uh, of those were detected. However, glyphosate was applied in large amounts and it was not studied. So why wasn't it studied? Because it's harmless. Nobody thinks it's causing any problems. 5% solution of glyphosate was also used heavily around the irrigation ditches to control weeds, and it was the main herbicide that was recommended for this purpose because of its low toxicity. Glyphosate has been linked to anencephaly due to its effect on retinoic acid, um, which I have a paper right here. That's the same problem that these people are having. This has been shown to cause it in animal models. Glyphosate goes in, increases retinoic acid, causes, upsets these guys, and introduces these various problems with the head, uh, including microcephaly, small brain. So it makes sense that glyphosate would be causing this problem in Washington. Fertility rates are dropping worldwide. Um, they're falling rapidly in countries often to below the reproductive, you know, the, the, the re replace yourselves level, which means we'll eventually die out if we keep this up. Um, so cultural changes certainly play a role. People want to have smooth, uh, fewer children, but I think glyphosate is also contributing significantly to the infertility problems that we're seeing. Uh, sperm depend upon cholesterol sulfate for decapitation and fertilization, and cholesterol sulfate synthesis depends on one of these side enzymes that are disrupted by glyphosate. And um, so that could explain the problem with fertility. Um, so here's a study of 26,000 men in France which found that they had sperm concentrations had decreased by 32% uh, since the 1990s. That's, of course, when glyphosate started to get introduced into France. And then they steadily dropped by 2% per year from uh, over that period. And also the proportion of normally found, formed sperm also declined by about one third. So the sperm are not normally formed and there's fewer of them. Um, kidney failure. So this is an interesting, uh, thing that I've looked into recently. We talk about it in our new paper. Um, agricultural workers in both Central America and in India are dying at a young age of kidney failure. And they're trying to figure out what could be causing this. Some suggestions they've made is arsenic exposure or excess use of Tylenol for pain. Well, one thing, if Tylenol could be involved because glyphosate disrupts the enzyme that breaks it down. So that will make Tylenol much more toxic. That's another site enzyme. Um, however, um, you know, glyphosate can cause kidney failure through other methods too, which involves all these disrupted gut bacteria that produce these toxic phenols, which can destroy the kidneys. And of course, it increases diabetes, which also leads to kidney failure. So there's many, many paths from glyphosate to kidney fail failure. Um, what, so what's killing them? Well, so you look at this picture of a crop dusting plane in Costa Rica, 
And here's a paper written in 1990, the effect of applying glyphosate as ripener in three sugarcane varieties. What this means is they're spraying glyphosate on the sugarcane crop, which is a major crop in Central America, right before the harvest, the same as they're doing with wheat in the United States. This also means that glyphosate is going to be present in your sugar, from both the cane sugar and from the high fructose corn syrup, because that's coming from GMO corn that's also being sprayed with glyphosate. And this could be the reason why sugar has become so toxic. You know, people talk about sugar's bad for you. It might be that it's the glyphosate in the sugar that's causing all the damage. So recapitulation, glyphosate is a known endocrine disruptor it, uh, in infer infertility, birth defects, breast tumor cells uh, problem, concentrations parts per trillion, um, upregulates retinoic acid, which can cause microcephaly and an anencephaly, in, and could explain this high incidence of this problem in Yakima. Agricultural workers in Costa Rica and India are experiencing high risk of kidney failure, which could also be due to this pre-harvest application of glyphosate. In fact, uh, Louisiana also has a very high rate of kidney, kidney failure compared to the overall average in the states, and they also produce uh, sugarcane crops that are sprayed with glyphosate right before the harvest. Okay, new GMO research. Um, Glyphosate-resistant weeds, a huge and growing problem. When you spray the glyphosate on the crops, the weeds become resistant to the glyphosate and then you have to add more. So you end up putting a lot more glyphosate on the crops than you would otherwise have done because you can't kill these weeds. And so they're starting to use more glyphosate, also using additional herbicides on top of the glyphosate with different functioning. So you're gonna get a complex combination of two different herbicides causing different disruptions, working together to cause, cause damage. Or they can use, increase the use of tillage to actually kill the weeds. So I want to talk about this GMO research in Waimea, Kauai. This is dear to my heart because I have a house in Kauai. We have a vacation home there, so I care about this a lot. And we were there last summer, and we were very actively involved in the movement uh, against this uh, horrible development in this beautiful garden island where they're developing all these uh, companies. Amazingly, not Monsanto, they've moved out, but all these other chemical companies are developing new GMOs um, that will be resistant to glyphosate and some other herbicide, such that we can now indiscriminately play, to, to spray you know, 2,4-D or atrazine on top of glyphosate to get even more chemicals into our food. 98% um, of the restricted use pesticides that are used in Kauai are used on these plants that are being developed, these new GMO crops. Here's a quote. Uh, on Kauai, we have 12,000 acres owned by or leased to all these companies for GMO chemical open air testing. These bands are used for experimental crop trials for some of the most controversial technologies and chemicals of our time. These chemicals run off our lands and into our streams and eventually pollute our oceans and leave a toxic residue for years to come. So first Waimea, that's the place where all this is happening, then the world, because once we have, once these things get out, it's gonna be a global health problem. Once they develop these new GMOs, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine the consequences of glyphosate plus one of these other that are restricted use herbicides. Glyphosate is not even restricted use. Things like 2,4-D atrazine, glufosinate, the can, but these are really serious uh, chemicals. So uh, Waimea has had 80 different pesticide products applied. Health problems are showing up predictably from the people living there. Asthma, nosebleeds, heavy bleeding and miscarriages among women, alarming cancer rates. Class action lawsuit against Pioneer involves 60 families with these various problems. And then my hero, Gary Hooser, has put together a bill which we were actively campaigning to get to pass over the summer, uh, 2491, which had a lot of restrictions where it required them to inform people where they were applying what, when, and also to, to not apply the pesticides near schools, for example. They were applying them in fields right next door to schools for children. So um, this is what makes me very happy. This bill, 2491, it passed this morning at 2.30 in the morning <laughs> over there in Hawaii. So one small victory <laughs> for this you know, new world order. So I think this might, you know, I feel this is like the turning point. I can hope that uh, enough people will start to become informed and people will start to realize that we cannot, this is not sustainable agriculture. The path we are on is destructive. We have to change the way we grow food if we're going to not end up having every well person in the, in the world spending all of their time taking care of the people who are sick and needy. 
I mean, we have to do something different. So here's what Don Huber has to say. I didn't mention Don Huber, but he's the person who gave, I heard him give a two-hour lecture right before, when I figured out. He explained why the gut bacteria were a problem in autism for me, and that started me on this whole pathway of studying glyphosate. When future historians write about our time, they're not going to write about the tons of chemicals that we did or didn't apply. When it comes to glyphosate, they're going to write about our willingness to sacrifice our children and jeopardize our existence, while threatening and jeopardizing the very basis of our existence, the sustainability of our agriculture. Very well said. He's a, uh, a retired um, professor from Purdue who has worked all of his life on plant pathology and plant physiology, so he understands this very, very well. And he has seen through what happens to the plants how damaging glyphosate is to any biological system. So the US government does not, does minimal monitoring of glyphosate residues in food. Here's a picture of a typical fast, fast food meal. You've got wheat that's been desiccated with Roundup right before the harvest. You've got GMO soy protein filter in your hamburger. You've got cows fed GMO corn and soy going into your beef and your cheese. You've got potatoes that were desiccated with herbicides right before the harvest. You've got GMO canola oil. You've got high fructose corn syrup, GMO, going into the, the, the ketchup and the, and the drink. So is this going to have glyphosate in it? So how about testing? I found a 2011 195-page document from the US uh, Department of Agriculture. Only one food item was listed in 195 pages. Only one food item was tested for glyphosate, which was soy. A good choice, because soy is GMO, and it's got lots of glyphosate being sprayed on it. Did they find any? Out of the samples, 90% had tested positive for glyphosate. And 96%, almost 96%, tested positive for AMPA, which is a breakdown product of glyphosate. So basically, they all have glyphosate in them. So here's another problem. No studies have been done assessing the effects of glyphosate on humans. Monsanto is making sure that we don't do these tests. But there was, and again, after our paper was written, when we wrote our paper, we tried so hard to find any evidence of glyphosate in human blood, in human urine, we couldn't find anything. Nothing had been reported. So we simply had to say, we don't know. After we wrote our paper, this study came out in Europe. A good study, 180 urine samples, over 18 different countries in Europe. City dwellers. So city dwellers are not going to be people on the farm who are going to pick up exposure from their crops. Never had handled a Roundup or any herbicides. 44% of them had glyphosate in their urine. 7% had a level that was considered to be the cutoff for safety. Now, they, they don't really even know what's safe, but at least they, had, they were hitting that, that, rec, that level. And so they concluded that diet must have been the main source of this glyphosate that was getting into their urine. These numbers would be much worse if they were to be measured in the United States. But as far as I know, nobody has measured them. We have been trying to find a way to measure glyphosate in, your, in urine or blood, and we cannot find any company anywhere who will do that for us. Because we have plenty of people who would like us to do that for them, Anthony and I. Here's a quote from this paper. Our testing highlights a serious lack of action by public authorities across Europe and indicates that this weed killer is being widely overused. Governments need to step up their monitoring and bring in urgent measures to reduce its use. This includes rejecting any genetically modified crops that would increase the use of glyphosate, which is what we've got. 90% of our GMOs are genetically engineered to be resistant to glyphosate. And that's why, that's a key reason why we have this huge increase in exposure over the last 10 years. So <laughs> here's my big message of the night. <laughs> this is a picture from our kitchen. <laughs> we buy we try to buy everything organic now, um, and we have been doing so for some time now. And I would encourage everybody to switch to organic food and to tell everybody you know, your friends and, your, any, and your, anybody you know, your family, your friends, tell them to go organic. And they will notice substantial health improvement if they do so. I can, I, I can almost guarantee it. So, we should be very worried about our glyphosate in the food and water, glyphosate's disruption of gut bacteria, depletion of essential amino acids and minerals, and interference with cytochrome P450 enzymes have widespread consequences. It can explain health problems worldwide, including autism, diabetes, infertility, kidney failure, gluten intolerance, cancer, etc. It needs to be removed from the market, and we need to find the path to sustainable, pesticide-free agriculture. I believe this very, very strongly.
Thank you. <laughs>